Would would you say in your opinion that Cornell University's made a mistake with this building? Uh, I would say it's a disaster rather than just a mistake. Episode 26. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back. I am your host, Enoch Sears, and this is The Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. What role does abstraction and the exploration of theory deserve in architecture? Should the avant-garde give consideration to function and practicality? MIT files a $300 million leaky building suit against Frank Gehry. More recently, Raphael Vignoli's walkie-talkie tower melts cars with a powerful death ray of which Darth Vader would be proud. In today's episode, we go deep into the rabbit hole with Cornell professor Jonathan Oxhorn who calls the $50 million cool house designed Milstein Hall at Cornell University a, quote, disaster. Listen to this episode to find out why. All right, welcome back, Agile Architects. This is Enoch from Business of Architecture. And today I have the privilege of having someone who taught me at Cornell University, Professor Jonathan Oxhorn. He's a registered architect with an academic background in structural engineering and urban design, as well as architecture. And prior to joining the faculty at Cornell University in 1988, he taught at City College of New York while serving as an associate director of the City College Architectural Center, which is a research center supplying technical assistance to community groups in New York City. His publications include studies on energy loss through tapered insulation, as well as the political and economic underpinnings of sustainable building. He's the author of Structural Elements for Architects and Builders and has developed several interactive computer programs which are available online at no cost. And Professor Oxhorn teaches in the areas of construction technology and structures, and he also offers an elective course focusing on the science and politics of green building. And Professor, I believe you are currently involved in the graduate studies at Cornell? I'm Director of Graduate Studies, which is primarily an administrative position. But uh, at this point, when you were in school, we didn't have a professional master's program. Now we have a professional master's program as well as the five-year B-Arch and a post-professional master's and, and history of architecture, Ph.D. And out there somewhere is the uh, Master of Science in Computer Graphics. So I'm, I'm involved with, with the students through my teaching more than as a graduate mentor. The, the director of graduate studies is mostly an administrative position to make sure the trains run on time, things like that. Okay, great. Well, now, now that we have a captive audience, can you give us a little plug for the graduate school there at Cornell, people who might be interested in considering the school? Well, for the architects out there, or the would-be architects, um, we have two programs, and, and the uh, professional master's is nominally a three-and-a-half-year program if you're coming from any subject at all. And it's relatively new, but it's, it's getting some recognition. We're, we're now on the map, getting rated fairly highly. Um, and so we're pretty pleased with the progress of the uh, professional masters. We'll have a new director uh, coming in January, and so we're very optimistic about that. We also have the post-professional masters, uh, which is a one-year, three-semester program, including a summer. And that's for... Uh, Typically, the, the demographic is our, our students who have a Bachelor of Architecture and want some more advanced uh, study. And that's also uh, fairly successful now. We have a great program that starts off in New York City on 17th Street, and then it moves up to Ithaca for the fall and spring terms. Wonderful. And for students who may be considering attending Cornell, can you give them an idea of sort of the philosophy at Cornell that they might expect to find there? The philosophy is interesting. I mean, it's um, there's, there's a real intense interest in, in the uh, characteristics of formal design, and there always has been, and I think there always will be. It's, um, it's a program that doesn't have a distinct philosophy uh, in terms of uh, uh, stylistic preferences. Um, we have a lot of visiting faculty, and they bring their own uh, interests. I think what, every, what, what it 
all of the designers have in common is a kind of an intensity and an interest in what, the, what things look like and what the world looks like and, and the meaning of things. So uh, being at Cornell, there isn't a lot else to do if you're a professor. And so we get people who really want to teach and have a certain intensity about the teaching. I think that's the strong part about uh, learning architecture at Cornell. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I definitely found that to be the case when I was there. Now, I'm just going to read here an intro that you have on your website, one of your works, which is a, a critique of Milstein Hall. And Milstein Hall is recently built. And I'm just going to read this here, and then we'll jump into our conversation about it, okay? This is from an analysis of Milstein Hall by Jonathan Oxshorn, and this is from the introduction. Milstein Hall at Cornell University, designed by Rem Koolhaas and OMA, is an interesting building, in some ways an amazing building, but by virtually any conceivable objective criterion, a disaster. That something, can, that something amazing can simultaneously be a disaster is hardly a paradox. In fact, disasters are often amazing, and our amazement often increases proportionally with the range and scope of the disaster. I will not be criticizing the visual appearance of this building or making judgments about its subjective aesthetic merit. I personally find the building interesting and its underlying formal rationale provocative and compelling. But I am not particularly qualified to render such judgments, and other authorities or connoisseurs of architectural taste may well disagree. What follows instead is an objective critique of Milstein Hall looking at the building in some detail from a series of different points of view, none of which are driven by aesthetic considerations. So, Professor, I found this online, and it was, it's a fascinating article, and I'll link up to it in the interview. But can you give us a background of what is Milstein Hall for those people who might not be familiar with it? Milstein Hall is, a, is an addition to two existing and old buildings on the Cornell campus that house the architecture program. Sibley Hall dates from the mid to late 19th century, uh, uh, what used to be called ordinary construction, like a mill building with wood, wood floors and masonry exterior walls. Rand Hall is a bit newer, early 20th century, steel, reinforced concrete, but also with a brick masonry cladding that's embedded into the steel frame. So you have these two buildings maybe 60 feet apart, and we're running out of space. We are, we're getting pressure from accreditation boards to make the facilities a little bit better, a little bit bigger, and the program is growing. So there were a series of architects that were hired there was a, a competition that was run uh, in which Stephen Hall was the, was the winner. Um, in the end, none of those projects were successful. They didn't, uh, for various reasons. And we had a new dean who brought in Rem Koolhaas OMA and convinced all the powers that be at Cornell that he was the architect that could finally give us a, a building. And the scheme that he created was unprecedented. I mean, there were hundreds of schemes in the last 20 or 30 years for a new addition to the architecture building. And his was absolutely unique, uh, audacious, and um, no one in their right mind would have thought of it. And yet, when you see it as a schematic design, it is rather compelling. It's rather interesting as a formal idea. It's a, a thin pancake of the building with an enormous floor area lifted off the ground on a kind of, well, I can't really say Mesian piloti, that's a contradiction in terms, but let's just say on columns. And it connects these two buildings, uh, literally just, it's a rectangle that, that just runs right into Rand Hall on one side and Sibley Hall on, on the other side, connecting them at the second level. Underneath is a rather complex, doubly curved, reinforced concrete deformation of the ground plane that people call the dome. It's not really a dome. And that comes up from the ground plane and intersects the bottom of this huge second level pancake of a building. In the, in the concrete dome underneath, you have an auditorium and a critique space. And then on the huge space at the second level, which connects into the two existing buildings, you have one uh, 25,000 square foot studio space, essentially uh, uninterrupted by walls. And, and the idea is that 
This building uh, literally and metaphorically joins all of the buildings together. Um, it cantilevers in a very aggressive way over the street, which you'll remember is University Avenue, and comes 15 feet away or so from this old uh, 19th century foundry building across the street in, in, a, in a rather aggressive way. And I use the word aggressive uh, only because of the historic context. These are uh, buildings that are um, listed uh, in terms of historic value, historic preservation. And so build, uh, cantilevering the building out almost uh, looms right over the foundry. It's a rather aggressive kind of uh, notion of historic preservation. But um, as I said, I'm not criticizing it uh, for any of these uh, reasons. In fact, it's uh, kind of interesting uh, because of its audacity. Um, so that, that was its purpose, and it, it happened right in the middle of the financial crisis, and it was absolutely amazing that this thing got built. It's extremely expensive much more money than anybody wanted to spend, and yet uh, the, the, the people in charge were able to convince the university, the provost, to, to build this thing, and, and it got built. So that in itself is, is amazing, because it's a, it's a complex building and an expensive building. Um, so it, it's, it's, I would say it's been fairly successful in terms of generating a buzz for the program. Uh, the students seem to like it. The space is sort of interesting, being up there with all of the students. Um, and its relationship to the auditorium is very clever and seems to be effective. So it's not as though the building is a complete disaster. I'm looking at it from other objective criteria, and that's, that's where I'm drawing this conclusion. I'm also, I also have a long-standing interest in what I've called non-structural failure, that is, how buildings fail, not, not that they're collapsing, as a, in terms of structural failure, but how the roof leaks and the curtain wall leaks and, well, a lot of it is leaking, but there's also cracking and, and other forms of functional uh, failure. And uh, that's the critique that I made about Milston Hall. Okay. Well, I'm going to, so I'm just going to use the word architecture because that's just a, a common term that we like to attribute to these architects that are stretching the boundaries of what we normally think can be done. Um, is your analysis in any way um, a larger critique? Is there any of that in the analysis of star architecture in general versus um, functional considerations? I think there is. A, I think it can be generalized. And I actually have written about what it is about modernism in particular or postmodern tendencies that have aggravated a pro this problem. Uh, I think it has something to do with an interest in abstraction that is, has become separated from the, the fundamental basis of building design. It's not that abstraction is new. Uh, when you read Alberti or um, other uh, Renaissance or post-Renaissance uh, theorists or writers, they, they've already understood architecture as, 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 as being uh, about abstraction, that you're abstracting from the reality of every little brick and stone and you have some larger conceptual basis for your architecture. So that isn't new. But in the past, with traditional architecture, the kinds of abstractions did not threaten the underlying basis of the construction. That is, they still built walls, the walls had windows, and they had a roof. And they were superimposing ideas on top of what was a pretty sound, fundamental understanding of building. And this changed in two dramatic ways. Probably at about the time uh, of the early 20th century with modernism, you might be able to trace, trace the roots a little bit earlier. Architects became interested in abstractions that no longer had a basis in the construction of buildings. If you look at Corbusier or, or many of the modernists, they're, they're no longer talking about walls and windows. They're talking about surfaces and planes and intersections and transparency. Uh, ideas that you see in, in art, for example, in, in the painters of the time. So that was one thing, is that the type of abstraction was radically different. 
And the second thing is that building technology had a, a radical change. And it, you're no, you know, in, in the, at the time of traditional, for example, masonry construction, you're talking about building pretty much monolithic walls out of brick and stone. And yes, there were technical issues that had to do with water penetration and so forth. But if you followed the basic rules, uh, you could pretty much make a building that would survive and um, be appropriate for the level of technology that existed. The type of stuff that you built with was the same type of stuff that you made your architecture with. The stone, the brick. That's different now. It turns out that if you read modern building construction texts, they're talking about control layers. They're not talking about stone and brick. They're talking about vapor control layers, water control layers, air control layers, thermal control layers. These things tend to be very ephemeral, soft, unheroic. You're not going to make a building out of a vapor barrier or out of a piece of rigid insulation. And yet those are the things that determine uh, more than anything else whether the building is successful or not. The continuity of these control layers is what building construction is all about. And so all of a sudden, on the one hand, you have this incredible abstraction from the reality of building. And on the other hand, you have building technology that no longer supports this heroic view of architecture. And so the combination affects the star architects maybe more than others because they tend to have a more extreme abstract notion of what architecture is. But in a way, it affects almost all architecture today. Uh, and I, I think that there's um, a bit of a, a crisis. It, uh, there's an epidemic of non-structural building failures. So many buildings leak or have other serious issues. And I think it can be traced to these two different two opposing tendencies. One is, one is how we abstract and the other how we build. Do you, do you see any practitioners out here that are, that are using this, this dichotomy, this push and pull between the functional nature of a building and the abstraction? Do you see any practitioners that are creating architecture to sort of investigate this or maybe that are doing a successful job of reconciling the two? Absolutely. Uh, so th they're, they're it is possible. Uh, right here on the campus, in the West Campus dorms by uh, Kieran Timberlake, um, a series of buildings which really try to deal with the kind of rain screen concept where they really express the, the, um, the openings into the rain screen cavity and do something with the brick and the flashing in a very explicit way to try to make architecture out of it, out of the necessities. So there are absolutely firms that are well aware of these issues and are trying to create some form of ex expression out of it. But I would say those are the exceptions rather than the rule. Okay. So let's, let's jump into Milstein Hall and tell me how your analysis began because we obviously have this landmark building that's being built on Cornell's campus by a Pritzker Prize winning architect and where, where does it go from there? Well, I'm a, I'm a, um, you know, a resident in Sibley Hall, and as, as I've said, Milstein Hall is going to jam up into the second floor. So even before it was built, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit scared. You know, what happens to these windows in Sibley Hall when they no longer are functioning as windows? And I started looking into the design, which was pretty much a, a tightly held secret. Um, nobody knew what it was until it was unveiled with great fanfare in a big ceremony in Bailey Hall with uh, Rem Coolhouse in attendance. And so at that point, we all saw what the building was, and I, I started worrying about the loss of windows. Uh, as I said, there's the second floor pancake uh, of a slab that, that eliminates the windows on the second floor, and so it was pretty clear that they would provide mechanical ventilation in Sibley to compensate for the loss of the natural ventilation. But what they hadn't accounted for were, were the windows on the first floor and the basement below this large slab. And uh, so I started uh, making some complaints about that. You know, if, 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 you have, if you're relying on natural ventilation and your window can't see the sky because there's this huge slab above you, uh, that seems to violate the principles of, uh, of logic, first of all, but also of the building code. 
And so after, uh, you know, this, it got complicated because not only were these windows going to be covered, but ultimately they figured out that the windows had to be covered by a fire resistant glazing in order to create a fire barrier between the old buildings and the new buildings. And that was an entirely separate issue, but it sort of forced the issue. And at that point, then they, they were forced to provide mechanical ventilation where they otherwise would not have. This solved my initial problem of natural ventilation versus mechanical ventilation, but it opened up a whole other series of problems dealing with fire safety. And the more I looked into it, the more problems I uncovered uh, about fire safety issues in this building. The, the main overarching issue had to do with the size. Um, building codes limit the size of buildings based on occupancy and construction type. It's the fundamental way that they control the risk of fire. Because if you have a wood frame building, the risk of fire is going to be greater than if you have a fireproof steel frame building, for example. And so you get a little bit of a bonus in the building code depending on your construction type. And in the same way, depending on your occupancy, if you're going to crowd lots of people into an auditorium or an exhibition hall or a dance hall, that also creates additional risk. So both the occupancy and the construction type in this matrix in the building code, and for the architects out there, they may be familiar with Table 503 uh, based on the International Building Code, which has been adopted by pretty much all the states now. That, that's the matrix that, that has occupancy on one axis, construction type on the other axis, and then you find out how much floor area you can have. And Sibley and Rand Hall were already pretty much at their limit, and by adding Milstein Hall to the mix, you're making the total floor area so large that the existing construction types just could not accommodate it. And so the building should never have been built. It's just a bad idea. The only way you could do it is by placing firewalls between Milstein Hall and the existing buildings. And then the building code allows you to consider any building separated by a firewall as its own building. They didn't want to build firewalls. It would be very difficult, given the schematic idea that they had, given the historic character of the Sibley building. What they found was a loophole in the 2002 New York State Code, and it only appeared in New York State. It was not derived from the International Building Code. So you, if you're listening from another state, you will never find anything like this. It was unprecedented, probably an error. Nevertheless, it allowed an addition in New York State in 2002 to increase the area of an existing building without a firewall, if you just placed a fire barrier, which is a, a smaller amount of protection. And it didn't set any limits to how big the addition could be. And they latched on to that loophole, knowing that as soon as the building was built, it would already be non-conforming, because the 2002 code was about to expire. They rushed their permit and working drawings down there before they were even finished to try to get in to this 2002 code, knowing that they could not build the building a month later. And uh, I think that in that decision was fundamentally flawed because when you build a non-conforming building, you can never upgrade it to a higher hazard occupancy, for example, because then that triggers all of the provisions of the new code and it's non-compliant under the new code. So you're just locking in problems, aside from the fact that you're creating a building that is just considered unsafe by any rational standard, simply by the fact that it has too much floor area. Nevertheless, this is what they did. They were supported by the building department in this endeavor, and they built the building. Um, we can fast forward a few years now. Um, there were all sorts of problems with that nonconformance, the first of which was that they decided to move the, the legendary and famous fine arts library into Rand Hall on the third floor. And because it's a connected building, its construction type is determined by the weakest link in all of the buildings, which is Sibley Hall. And a library is a high hazard occupancy. It's got a lot of books, which are fuel for a fire. You cannot put a library on the third floor 
of a type 5B building, which is the construction type of city hall. You just can't do it. And they did it anyway. The building department said, sure, you can do it. And it was clearly non-compliant. I, I um, filed a, a kind of a code appeal to challenge this, among other things. And the code appeal, uh, board of appeal, agreed with me. They said, yeah, you're right. You cannot put a library there. So the library is there, but it's not it's non-compliant and it's and instead of fixing the issues, Cornell has decided to apply for a variance. So a variance means that yes, we admit it's non-compliant, but instead of fixing it, we're going to just ask you for permission to keep it there. So that's where we are now with the library. And did you say the library is in which building? Is it in Sibley or Rand? No, it's moved out of Sibley, where, where it was when you were a student, and it's into the third floor of Rand Hall now. Okay, and Rand, Rand Hall is a type 5? Everything is type 5B. Oh, because okay, wow. It, Rand Hall would have been perfectly fine for the library before it was connected. But by connecting it with this, in this non-conforming way, they're just building in these problems. And um, they, also have, they also want to put the library on the second floor, which is also... Uh, non-compliant for a different reason. On the second floor, there's just too much floor area. So everything would have been possible had they con had they designed Milstein Hall not as an addition, but as more of a freestanding building with connections. Because hmm. you can connect buildings together without making them additions. By making it an addition, you you compromise the fire safety of the whole thing, and you you just create lots of problems. But there were other uh, fire safety issues that had nothing to do with this, and th those were much more puzzling. Interesting. Well, before we get into those, I just want to say that, I mean, this story is fascinating because it has, it has some intrigue, it has some, some suspense, it has all, I mean, if you're an architect, this is like, uh, this is like an action blockbuster movie <laughs> for me anyways. I mean, it's very, very interesting about to hear the dynamics. But I'm listening to this, and I'm just thinking, how is this affecting the dynamics on campus of you being a professor if you're sort of the whistleblower? I mean, is that causing some controversy, some drama within the, the, the structure of the school? How did that play out? I mean, did you become that guy or? Well, it's an interesting question and I wonder about it myself because mostly I, I don't get any feedback from my colleagues or from the administration. <clears throat> I'm quite certain that they're upset about it. Uh, but there's, but they're they're acting in a rather civil manner. At least the administrative people, um, the architects at Cornell who supervise the construction no longer talk to me. But I don't think it's because they don't. I think they are they're probably been given instructions not to talk to me, because it's entered into a kind of a legal phase where everybody is now being extremely careful. The dean of the college has just. Uh, gone into the Fine Arts Library where there was a set of working drawings for Milstein Hall, taken them back and destroyed them. So little things like that I don't take personally. I think that they're, that they're simply protecting themselves in the middle of this kind of lit litigious or whatever the, the word referring to um, legal action is. Uh, they're, they're, they may be overly cautious and, uh, and so sometimes it's difficult for me uh, to get information but um, but I'm still able to work with the, de with the dean and, and uh, you know we sort of have bracketed that part of our relationship and so it doesn't affect uh, for example my ability to function as the director of graduate studies and my colleagues I, I'm puzzled by them I, I I think they're aware of what's going on but I think they maybe find it a little awkward to talk about it many of them are are pretty big fans of the building and it's understandable because it's transformed the place. And maybe they're, they're focused primarily on design rather than on the technical subjects that I teach. So they have a different perspective perhaps. So I would say uh, there, there may be an undercurrent, especially at the higher administrative levels. But basically I'm just going about my business and everybody has been pretty friendly. <laughs> Fortunately. Well, you know, and this is amazing because I think this this particular story is almost symbolic in a larger sense of the conflict between this abstraction like we talked about before and the technical functionality of the building. I mean, this is just a perfect little mini drama that plays out a larger discussion. So take us now take us 
a little bit deeper into what you found out about Milstein Hall. And once again, we'll put out the disclaimer that you did mention that you're not doing an aesthetic critique. It's not a critique of the theory of the building or the impact it's had on the school, but it's merely a critique based upon um, non-aesthetic and objective considerations, as you said. Well, the overview is that I have a, a plan for a four-part division, and I've done three of the parts. So we talked a little bit about fire safety, and there are other fire safety issues. The most egregious one, under this amazing slab deformation, which created a kind of a dome, there is an enormous critique space. That is, that's the, the money shot for the building. That's where the reinforced concrete cast in place, incredible trust bridge running through it. Uh, the cast in place concrete is visible on the top surface of the dome. It connects into the auditorium in complex ways. That's where the geometry and the interest of the building is most intense. That enormous space, which can fit hundreds and hundreds of people and has, has only a single means of egress. Now, this is something that's rather basic. When you, when you have more than 50 people in a space, you need at least two means of egress. This space has way more than 50 people when it's used for assembly or exhibition or receptions. Hundreds of people, it needs at least three, possibly four means of egress, and it only had one compliant means of egress. The amazing thing is, first, that the architects designed it that way. Secondly, that the architects that on they hired to create the working drawings raised no objections. That the architects at Cornell University, who supervised this thing, raised no objections, and that the building department raised no objections. So this was part of my code complaint to the state, and, and as with the library, they agreed with me that the space is non-compliant, it can't have one exit. So what Cornell did is, is, rather than fix it again, they just put a sign up, occupancy limited to 49 people in this enormous space. And <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it, it I mean, it, it's not a satisfactory ending. First of all, it's, it's illegal. You can't just put up a sign to fix something that's, that's wrong. You can do it in an existing building, but for new construction, you basically have to provide exits if you make the space big. Yeah, I can't tell you how many restaurant owners I've worked for would love to just throw up a sign and get away with putting a protected exit out the back. Yeah, so anyway, but aside, so there's fire safety, and there were six or seven fire safety issues. Those two were the main ones. Then I have a whole section on sustainability, which is partly a criticism of Milstein Hall, but mostly using Milstein Hall as an, as, a, as an example of why the lead rating system is flawed in many ways. So it's more of a critique of the lead rating system using Milstein Hall. Milstein Hall is a gold certified lead building, which barely meets the energy standards of the New York State Code, let alone uh, having some exemplary uh, energy performance. Its, its shape is the absolute worst possible shape if you wanted to make a sustainable building from the standpoint of energy, in that it maximizes surface area by making this flat pancake and then raising it off the ground so that not only the roof is exposed, but the floor is exposed. It takes thermal bridging to a new level. It, it, as a kind of an art form with these huge metal columns that just go right from the uh, heated internal space to the outside cold space. The curtain wall is hung with uh, huge uh, linear uh, shelf angles which penetrate the rigid insulation. Again, thermal bridging. The whole thing uh, is a bit of a joke as a sustainable building and was never designed as one. They, but they, this Cornell has a policy now that every building needs to be lead rated. And so they, they made it lead rated. And so there's a critique of the sustainability. Uh, but in a sense, it's not Milstein Hall's fault since Rem Coolhouse had no interest in sustainability in designing the building. And it was some, something superimposed on him. It's more of a, a, a critique of the lead rating system. And then the third part of this critique has to do with the non-structural failure. And there is a whole series of little things and big things from the roof leaking to the curtain walls leaking to the concrete floor cracking uh, to um, various kinds of uh, protruding objects that are a hazard to people with uh, visual handicaps. A whole series of those. 
Uh, and that is tied into my long-term interest in understanding um, these kind of issues and what drives an architect to be so innovative and experimental that they lose track of some obvious things that improve the, the functionality of the building. Um, the last one, which I haven't written, has to do with flexibility. So the flexibility is going to deal with um, being able to expand or add on to the space. That'd be a problem, as you mentioned before, because it'd be non-conforming. Um, university buildings are constantly being transformed. If, if you look at Sibley and Rand Hall, the existing buildings, the change in use is, is just astounding. Uh, the libraries come, he, come in, the libraries go out. An office comes in, a classroom comes in. In Rand Hall, the computer graphics came in in the early 70s, then went out. They put a raised access floor. Um, the shop comes in. They, they put some exhaust ducts. Uh, recently, ceramic kilns came in, and they were able to accommodate that. None of those things could happen in Milston Hall. I, I, I sort of was joking with the faculty member who brought in the, the kilns for her interest in ceramics that uh, you know she's very lucky that there's Rand Hall and Sibley Hall because Milstein Hall could not accommodate a simple change like that. Uh, can you imagine punching a hole through the green roof of, of Milstein Hall to accommodate a flue or even uh, to put a partition to isolate it from the rest of the building? So there's something about the architecture that is so self-involved. As compelling as it may be, there is a little bit of a, uh, an issue about an architect being so interested in almost an adolescent feeling of look at me, look at me, look how wonderful I am, that the future um, changes that are inevitable are going to be really hard to do. That's the main issue. Uh, there, 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 then there are the, the kind of interesting issues about the, you know, the, the shape of the building itself, which is a big square, whereas all of the existing traditional campus buildings are rectangular. And the rectangular floor plan is much more flexible in terms of accommodating either a double loaded corridor with offices or a big classroom or a big auditorium. You will find in this big square that it's going to be very difficult to make it anything other than what it is, which is a kind of an open office space. Interesting. And is what, what is the current, what happens in that space right now Mil, um, in Milstein Hall? open office studio so it's just one big space with say 250 desks wow. so for that and that's how it was designed and it works my critique then is is not so much that it doesn't work for what it is but but if you just look at the history of campus buildings or even what are the needs of architecture in 10 or 15 years um, this building is going to have difficulty accommodating changes Okay. Would, would you say, in your opinion, that Cornell University's made a mistake with this building? Uh, I would say it's a disaster rather than just a mistake. Yeah. Okay. For all the reasons you just outlined. For and, reason, and for many more that are yet, yet to be manifested. Fascinating. And so do you have a conclusion in terms of this analysis, which is very in-depth, and I encourage all architects who are listening to go read this because it's actually pretty good, a pretty good, um, shall we say, way to be reminded of the different code considerations that we all deal with. But in terms of the push and pull between the abstraction and the technical details, you know, what, is there a deeper, I guess, a deeper um, conclusion that you're making with this analysis? <laughs> a lot about it uh, and I think it's, it's a tough question and I'm certain that if I was in charge of an architecture program to implement my ideas I, I would almost certainly kill the program because architecture thrives in this competitive world on pushing the envelope you use that that metaphor I'm thinking that the only sensible way to make architecture and to teach architecture is to understand the underlying constructional basis of the architecture. And if what we have now is a need to create continuous control layers, then that has to inform the teaching of architecture and the practice of architecture. I think it's absolutely possible to make architecture with those constraints, but it's absolutely true that those constraints are a threat to the freedom of expression. And 
a lot of architects are not willing to sacrifice that freedom of expression. Um, and so when you have architecture that is able to express itself built upon the necessities of construction as was possible for 2,000 years up until the 20th century, you may still have problems, but they're different kinds of problems. They're problems of people who didn't follow good advice or they were trying to be a little bit careless or save a little money. We have more fundamental problems today. I think the only answer is to build the architecture upon the constructional basis. And there are, as, I, as you asked and as I mentioned, there are examples where that's absolutely possible. But, it, but you have to, I think it's a mistake to, to think that the technology can be added to the expressive design. That's, that's what Milstein Hall attempted to do. Uh, Rem Koolhaas apparently is very much interested in the diagram, in the schematic notion of the building, and leaves it to others to fill in all of the technology. And you can see, using that as a case study, that it's a recipe for disaster. So it's a hard nut to swallow. And as I said, I, don't, I, I think it would be hard for architecture programs, which are organized entirely on the basis of defamiliarizing the students or, or de so that they unlearn everything they think they know about architecture and introducing extremely conceptual and abstract problems right from the start. Uh, I think you have to lose that and, and introduce little by little the elements of building technology and design first year, second year projects that build upon that rather than uh, hoping that somehow you can somehow fix the schematic designs in terms of these technologies. It just doesn't work because continuity is very hard to maintain when your architectural design is all about discontinuity. You're just creating a risk, a higher risk of problems. And I think that will lead to a lot more non-structural failure. Well, there was a several good quotable and tweetable um, sound bites in there, Professor, so I thank you for that. And what would you say, in terms of a larger effect that this, um, or what would you say to the person who says, well, listen, we, we're willing to deal with all the non-structural failures. We're willing to deal with the leaks. We're willing to deal with all that. That's the price we pay because we want the wow factor of this building. We're going to, we want the sculpture. We want something incredible and innovative. I would say um, if, if it's your house, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> If you're, if you're dealing with clients outside your own personal uh, little sphere of influence, maybe not so fine. If you're dealing with other people's money and they don't have the same priorities that you do, maybe not so fine. And the other report would be you can have both, right? You, 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 must, you have to change some of the preoccupations that have informed your design aesthetic, but it's not as though aesthetics and expression and avant-garde go away, uh, but, it, but you have to reformulate your priorities and then develop an architecture out of those. What effect do you see this kind of scenario that we're talking about now with Milstein Hall, the non-structural failures and the non-compliant code issues, how do you think this affects the profession overall and the perception people have of architecture and the way that it relates to the majority of professionals that try to carry out their duties? That's an interesting question, and you may be in a better position to answer that than I am, because I'm I'm on I'm in this ivory tower here, a little bit isolated from real clients and and um, the real uh, profession out there. As I said, I think there are architects that are sensitive to these issues, and would be perfectly happy to um, deal with uh, control layers as the basis of their architecture and uh, work within that those constraints. It's not easy, uh, first of all, because there are still all sorts of contradictions in providing these control layers. The, it seems so simple, and yet the cladding that protects the air barrier, for example, has to be attached through the air barrier to the structure. So you're always kind of in this position of, of compromising the barriers and the continuity that you've set up. So I'm not suggesting it's easy, but I think you have a much higher risk of failure if you simply uh, 
ignore those issues at the start. So people out in the profession have a, have a difficult time because they're working with the kind of prevailing state of the art, which, which is still, I think, needs a little bit of work in establishing all of these ways of, of reconciling the contradictions between the control layers. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your thoughts on Milstein Hall. We appreciate it. I think that um, you've given us a lot of a lot of interesting, uh, shall we say, hooks or things that might get people interested to go and find out more about the backstory, and fascinating analysis. Really appreciate your time on the show. And at the also, do you have a couple books that you can share with us that you enjoy? Well, you know, a, a long time ago, I read this really great book by Juan Pablo Banta called Architecture and Its Interpretation. And it, it, it was in the era of the semiotics and the interest in semiotics. It's about meaning and how meaning attaches to architecture. I don't agree with everything in the book, but I found it really refreshing, especially the way he critiques the critics of architecture and, um, and tries to indicate where the meaning of architecture resides. The other book that uh, I reread a little bit more recently is Delirious New York by our friend Rem Koolhaas. Uh, I was uh, stimulated to find out a little bit more about his, his thought process, even though this is an early book. And so I reread it and I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, again, disagreed with many of his conclusions. Uh, thought there were a lot of, uh, a lot of um, illogical arguments presented as logical arguments in the book but it was so wonderfully written. It's a pleasure to read it. Uh, and, and so uh, a very contrasting type of book, but uh, recommend it, especially if, if there's any, uh, anyone out there who's a, a lover of the old New York skyscrapers. Uh, this is the book to read or reread. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Professor Jonathan Oxhorn, joining us from Ithaca, New York. Thank you for your time and appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, Ina. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.